thank you for being here. Um, appreciate that. Um, I think most of you know me. I've you know done this training for the last few years on different topics. Um, my name is Steve McLean. I'm the Academic Safety Manager here at BYU and also the Radiation and Laser Safety Officer. Um, about so oh, four or five months ago, Amber, who's in charge of the training, approached me and asked me if I would be able to do training again uh, this year. Now, some of you may recall for the last couple of years, I've done electrical safety and we like barbecued the pickle. And so I told Amber, I said, you know, that's getting kind of old. We need to come up with something different. Would you mind if I did something different? And she said, sure, come up with whatever you like. And of course, then we had Christmas and then we had New Year's and I like put it off and put it off and put it off. And so like last week, I'm sitting at my desk thinking, oh crap, I've got to like do training here in a week. And so I, I was trying to think of something that would be relevant and useful to you, uh, that would be instructive, but would also be something that maybe you haven't done before. And so what I came up with is I thought we would talk about light. So I'm just going to turn off that light there just so you can see the slide a little bit better. So what we're going to do, um, usually this training has been about a half hour. This particular presentation is a little bit longer. It's going to take probably 45 minutes to an hour. Now I know of at least one person in here who has to go to a work order or some kind of progress meeting. If you've got thing, commitments that you need to be to, feel free to bail out if you've got to. Otherwise I invite you to hang around because I think the information we have will be helpful to you. Uh, at least I hope it will be. Um, okay, so when we're talking about light, what we're really talking about is the electromagnetic spectrum. It's all electromagnetic radiation. Uh, I grab my laser pointer, which is right here. And so you've probably seen this. So you got radio waves down there and microwaves and infrared, and here's visible light and ultraviolet. Now, it's kind of a misnomer because you usually hear people say radio waves, or you hear them say gamma rays. But really, they are all light waves. So when you talk about it, it's all light. So your car, when you turn on the radio, doesn't receive radio waves. It receives light waves in the radio frequency. So car radio, you know, and any radio uses light to receive the music, your cell phone, they actually use light to receive calls and send and receive text messages. Microwaves, even though they have a visible light so you can see your food cooking, it's actually microwave light that is cooking your food. And doctors and dentists, you know, you think of an x-ray, well that's actually a form of light that you can see through your body and see broken bones and tooth decay. So what we're going to do today is talk about all of these different segments and what some of the hazards are, uh, some of the things to be aware of, and some things you can do to protect yourself from them. So here's the first thing you need to know. Everything on that spectrum, the light waves uh, of all frequencies, they're all photons and they're all traveling at about 186,000 miles per second. Now you think about this for a minute. Our sun is a star, the next closest star beyond our sun is four light years away. So if it's traveling 186,000 miles per second, and you think how many seconds are in a year, and take that distance and multiply it by four, that's how far away the next nearest star is. Now, it takes a long time, even at that speed, for the light to get that far. Uh, just kind of a little interesting factoid there. Now, one other thing you need to know is the wavelength. So all of these photons, whether we're talking about microwaves or radio waves or x-rays, they're all traveling in a wave. And they're flying through the space right here, right now. The distance between the crest of two waves is the wavelength. So there's a longer wavelength and a shorter wavelength. That's one thing you need to know. Um, the other thing you need to know is, suppose you were to put a marker right here, because these are all traveling, remember, at 186,000 miles per second. Now, depending on the wavelength, that next wave will pass a given point in a certain amount of time. So the frequency of the wave is how many of those wave crests pass a given point in a second. 
and that is Hertz. So for all the electricians in here, and maybe all the others who aren't electricians, what's the frequency of our lights in here, the visible lights? 60 Hertz. So what that's saying is, is you got about 60 of those waves passing through a given point in a second. Now, the relationship between, all, no, let me back up and tell you one thing here. For the next five slides, there's a lot of science and a lot of chemistry and a lot of other physics and things like that. Trust me, just bear with, don't worry about the details. Get the big picture because as soon as we start going into all these individual segments, you'll start to see how all this applies to you. So for right now, just go for, for the overall idea. So our speed, which is 186,000 miles per second, you, multi uh, you take that and that speed is equal to the wavelength multiplied by the frequency. And the energy of that photon is that number right there, which is also called Planck's constant, multiplied by the frequency. The message for you is, by those two simple equations, the wavelength, the frequency, and the energy are all interrelated. Now it so happens that the relationship, if you do the math, is such that as the frequency, as the wavelength gets shorter, as the frequency goes up, the energy goes up. So radio waves, which have a very long wavelength, or fairly low energy, gamma rays and x-rays, which have a very short wavelength, very high frequency, have a lot of energy. And our bodies interact with those different wavelengths in different ways, and that's what we want to talk about. So, here's all our sections here. You got the radio waves, and you notice in meters they're all pretty long, and they go up here to where they're really short, and the energy and the frequency are all associated. Now, don't worry about what all those numbers are specifically. Just be aware that radio waves are long, gamma rays are short. Okay, there's one other thing we need to talk about before we get into these different groups. Um, you remember, those of you who are here for the electrical safety that we did last year when we barbecued the pickle, we talked about the structure of an atom and how you got the protons and neutrons in the nucleus and all the electrons flying around the outside. Now, for non-ionizing radiation, so this includes radio waves, all your microwaves, the infrared, visible, and most of the UV, when one of those photons hits an atom, and this could be any atom, it could be your eyeball, it could be your skin, your clothes, the table, whatever it hits, when those come in, watch that electron right there, it moves it up to a higher energy level is what it does. It's non-ionizing. So these circles represent various energy levels and when it absorbs the energy of one of those photons, it excites it to a higher energy level. And that higher energy level generally causes heat. As though, and then as things cool off, it releases that energy and comes back down. So all these photons we're talking about, whether they're radio waves or microwaves or x-rays or whatever, they are, you can think of them all as little bundles of energy. Now, suppose I take a rock and I heave it at your face. That rock has a certain amount of energy, right? Now, any type of electromagnetic radiation that's out there, although those rocks are very, very small, essentially no mass, they all have energy in them. And the more, your body can only withstand a certain amount of energy before things start going wrong. Now, God did a pretty good job of making our bodies. They're pretty resistant to a lot of different types of energy. But you exceed the capacity, and then you start getting things like cancer and malignant melanoma and other things like that. And that's what we're going to talk about. So now, ionizing radiation. These are much more dangerous. These are the short wavelengths, high energy. So the far end of the UV spectrum, the X-rays and gamma rays. Now, when this photon comes in, what happens is it actually kicks the electron out of the atom. So now you have a negative charge here and a positive charge left over here. And that ionization causes real problems in humans and any other living organism because that's where tumors start to grow and DNA gets messed up and things like that. So again, most of them are down here non-ionizing, but we want, we'll see in a few examples of ionizing radiation when we go on. So here's our spectrum. 
We got our long radio waves down here, our microwaves, and up to the gamma rays. Remember, as we're, we increase energy going up, we're increasing the wavelength going down. So let's talk for just a couple minutes about these radio waves. AM radio, not too many folks listen to AM much anymore. It's usually FM because you get better sound quality. Those have pretty long waves. You get up FM radios around in this range in here and your cell phone are kind of right around almost going into the microwave range. But they're all or regulated by, there's ANSI standards out there, FCC. Here's what you need to know though. Below about 30 megahertz, those waves, because of the structure of our bodies, those waves have a tendency to go right through them. It's kind of like sitting here right now. There's radio waves and TV waves and who knows what other kind of waves all bouncing around in this room. We can't see them, but they're all different forms of light. But they're passing right through us. We don't feel them. They don't really affect us. You get up in the 30 to 300 megahertz band, the body tends to absorb them. So if you get in a high field of electromagnetic radiation in that frequency, your body tends to absorb them and that, like we talked about, the knot tends to excite those electrons, causes things to vibrate and you end up heating up and you cook yourself from the inside out. And then you get above about 300, 300 to 300 gigahertz. Overall, your body doesn't absorb those as well, but your eyes and keynote to a lot of folks in here maybe, male reproductive organs tend to absorb in that wavelength. So if you look at the chart here, so here's your frequency. Think of it also as wavelength because they're related. So here's your AM waves down here, your FM, which is in this range right here. Your cell phone and your microwave ovens are about in here. Who's familiar with OSHA? Occupational Safety and Health Administration. The permissible exposure limit. Who's familiar with that? One or two of you. The, the PEL, the permissible exposure limit, as the name implies is, that is the legally allowable, if you are an employer, that is what you can allow your employees to be exposed to over a given amount of time or concentration before there are problems. So OSHA said the PEL at 10 milliwatts per square centimeter is six minutes. And we'll see why this is important here in just a minute. Now you notice, so here's your frequency, here's the power level of it. And when you get in the range where the body tends to absorb it, here is your occupational allowed limit. It goes way down here because in this range, your body's absorbing more of it. So they say you're only allowed to be exposed in that range to a lower amount. Now, let's see a quick demo of that. You want to, somebody want to kick that light on? Um, uh, on, yeah, so we can see up here a little better. So this is just kind of my way of visually showing what's going on here. I've got a couple of tuning forks here. Uh, they're mounted on this sound box and this end of the box is open. And so it allows the sound waves to go out. Now, this fork is tuned identical to this fork. They have the same frequency. So listen carefully what happens when I strike that one. Do you hear it? So when I hit this one, the energy comes over and because this is a suitable match, when I stop this one, that one absorbs the energy. Now, notice what happens here though. Obvious different frequency, different size pitchfork. Watch what happens here. Do you hear it? No. This one transfers over to here because they are a matched frequency. This one, because it's different, doesn't start this one to vibrate. Same kind of idea happens up here. If your body is such that it is matched, if you will, to whatever frequency is out there, then your body will tend to absorb it and it will start to take on the characteristics of that source. If it's different, then it doesn't affect you and it goes right through you. 
Now, here's why that's important. Okay, if we get that front light again, thanks. This is a picture up on the roof of the Smoot building. So we're looking kind of west. That's the tower on the Hinckley Center. And if you go up there on the roof, there's this big cell phone tower up there. We've leased it to AT&T. And you got these barriers up there and all these barricades and all these warning signs. This one says AT&T operates antennas in this site. Beyond this point, you're entering blah, 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 blah. Uh, I got this sign over here. Radio frequency fields beyond this point may exceed the FCC general public exposure limit. That's that chart we were just looking at. What it says is you go up on the roof inside this fenced area, you're allowed to be in there for six minutes before you start absorbing enough of that energy that you start cooking yourself. So you need to stay out of that area or limit your exposure to it or shut off the antenna before you go up there. Now, this is not the only one on campus. If you go over to the Harold B. Lee Library, at least the last time I was there, it was still there. They may have moved it. On South Wall of the Library, I think it's like third floor, right outside the window, as you stand there looking out South Campus, your view of the Life Sciences Building, right there, right on the other side of the glass, is another tower like this, a little bit smaller, but same idea. And we in risk management had someone call us up and say, hey, I read this sign and it's right outside the window where I'm sitting. Am I in danger? And the answer is no, because the antenna, all those waves are pointing south, away from the building. They're not in a field where they're going to be exposed and it's fine. So just be aware that when you see these kind of signs, that kind of energy, although you think, well, radio waves aren't going to hurt us. I mean, there's radio everywhere, and we're all sitting there with our cell phones glued to our ears all the time. It's going to, like, nuke my brain. No, it's not. But just be aware, there is energy there, and that is being absorbed. That's simple physics. Okay, next group, microwaves. Question? Yeah. If you go into that area for three or four minutes and leave, you come back, does it start the clock over or is it cumulative? <laughs> Excellent question. The answer is I don't know this specific FCC regulation. What they would typically do, that, that six part per million is a time weighted average. So uh, who's familiar with time weighted average? That's in a 24 hour period. Eight hour. Eight hour, eight hour work period. So for example, I, I'm more dealing with, with chemicals. So say for example, acetone. Uh, most people are familiar with that. Let's say, and I'm just pulling numbers out of the hat here, so don't quote me on these numbers, but let's say the permissible exposure limit is 2,000 part per million over a time-weighted average. What that means is you could be exposed to 4,000 for four hours and none for the other four hours so that over eight hours your average is at two. Make sense? It would probably be the same kind of thing. Again, don't quote me. I'd have to go back and read the regulations, but it's a time-weighted average. Um, given that, you would probably be fine. And again, there are guidelines, but there's, there's, I'm trying to remember, there's something kind of weird in the rule about that. That, yeah. It's a slow cook. Anyway, so ho hopefully that was helpful. Uh, we'll see if we can find out more. Microwave ovens, we've all used them. These have a frequency between about 1 and 100 gigahertz. Now, put that in a number you can understand. The wavelength is between about an eighth of an inch to about 12 inches. So happens that the microwaves that actually cook your food are about five inches long, the wave that's going through there. Uh, anybody got a 2.4 gigahertz router in their house? Yeah. Wi-Fi router? Maybe a five gigahertz? Yeah. Those are all microwaves. Uh, anybody live near a cell phone tower that has these cool looking dishes on them? Those are microwaves. Now, is there a problem living next to that tower? No. But again, because of the energy drop off, that's why they're way up in the air um, and the direction of them. So they're about five inches long. Now here's a question for you. If the inside of that microwave oven is metal, why do they tell you not to put metal inside a microwave? But why does it start a fire? <laughs> it's all, the darn thing is made of metal. I don't know. You want to find out? Sure. Okay. A related question. 
If you've ever looked at the door of a microwave, they have that metal screen that has all the little holes in it. Why is that there? Exactly. Those little holes are designed so that the visible light from your light bulb that's in there to make you so you can see, watch your food cooking, the visible light, which has a much shorter wavelength, is able to go through those holes, but the microwaves, which have a much longer wavelength, can't make it through the holes, so you can sit there and watch your popcorn burning without frying your face with all the microwaves. Now, those are designed so that as the microwaves come into the oven, they reflect off, and the oven is designed so they reflect those microwaves to the center of that glass tray to put maximum amount of energy into the food that you're trying to cook. When you put in a fork or a spoon or whatever else, it screws up those reflections, and the energy of those microwaves gets absorbed into the metal, and it starts building up an electric charge until basically that fire, it either cooks, starts burning what's in there, or you get the little bolts of lightning. It's kind of like a static electric spark as it's discharging that energy that's being absorbed by the microwaves. There we go. All right. So, why are some containers labeled as microwave safe and others aren't? They don't reflect the, What's that? They don't reflect the uh, wave. You're on the right track. They don't absorb. Some absorb and some don't. It's how they reflect things. Now, this is a water molecule here. It's what they look like. So your red is oxygen, your white ones here are hydrogen, so you have H2O. If you were to cut that water molecule right down the middle this way, would that half look the same as the other half? Yeah, they're symmetrical, right? Now, imagine the plane of the screen here. If you were to cut that molecule in half that way, would the front half look the same as the back half? Yeah. If you were to cut it in half in this plane, obviously that half is different than that half, right? That makes water a polar molecule. This is why oil and water don't mix. Water is polar, oil is not. It turns out that polar molecules are affected by microwaves. So foods that have high water content, those microwaves hit that water molecule and it causes the water molecules to flip back and forth. And that friction and motion causes heat. And so they start warming up. And so your microwave safe cookware would be designed so that the molecules don't absorb the energy. And so it goes into the food instead of cooking or melting your dish. Now, BYU, we've had a number of fires in microwaves in office buildings and all kinds of other places. Usually it's popcorn or people cooking baked potatoes. Uh, What's that? Burritos. Yeah, frozen burritos. There you go. Is that the voice of experience talking? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, here's the kicker, though. Excessive exposure to microwaves can affect the lens of your eye, um, contribute to cataracts, and cause thermal burns, again, as that water starts to heat up. So let's move on into infrared rays now. Infrared is about half of the energy of the sun that arrives here on the earth. So I'm not talking about what goes off into space. I'm not talking about what gets absorbed into the atmosphere. I'm talking about what actually lands here on the surface of the earth where you and I are standing. About half of that is infrared energy. About an, almost a little less than another half is visible light, which allows us to see things. And then you get about 5% of the UV. Now, infrared radiation, if you take your average person, your skin, and you expose it to IR, you can get that skin to increase to about 104 degrees just from absorption of the infrared. Now, think about how rotten you feel when you have a fever of 104. Well, when you get exposed to that kind of UV or IR radiation, what it does is it starts prematurely aging your skin. How many of you have seen those folks that have been out in the sun their whole life and they've got that dry, leathery, wrinkled skin? Preserved. Part, yeah, preserved, yeah. Part of that is UV, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but part of that is by the absorption of that infrared. 
Now, here's the thing. Most people, when they say infrared, they tend to think the heat lamp in the truck stop, you know, where you got the burritos and the corn dogs there on display or, you know, or Arctic Circle or McDonald's, where they got that red light and it's keeping the french fries hot. Most people think, well, that's an infrared heat lamp. Are infrared rays hot? No, they're not. Radio waves aren't hot. TV waves aren't hot. Microwaves aren't hot. What happens is, is the energy of those light waves, those photons, gets absorbed by something and, as, and that builds up the heat and then it radiates thermal energy out of it. But you can't see them. That's the kicker. Our eyeballs are not designed to be able to see infrared rays. So you can't see them, they're not hot, you don't feel them, and that makes them particularly hazardous. Um, because your skin, if it's exposed to a lot of infrared, it starts heating up your tissues and you have nerve cells that you start feeling hot and uncomfortable, right? Your eyes may not do that. Your eyeballs, the, the cornea and the lens of your eye that we'll talk about in a minute, will absorb that energy and it will literally start cooking those tissues, but you don't get the pain signal in your eyes like you do when it hits your skin of feeling uncomfortable and warm. So they're particularly dangerous to your eyes. We have folks here on campus, uh, mostly in engineering and over in chemistry, that have lasers that operate in the infrared range. You can't see them, you can't feel them, but if you go like that and look into the beam of the laser, you blind yourself permanently. So they're kind of uniquely hazardous. Now, if anybody wants to look at the sun and see that half, I've got a solar filter here. If after class anybody wants to look at the sun, if there's any clouds in the way, let me know, we can go do that later. So here's your eyeball. In the back of your eye, you have your retina there. The front of your eye is your cornea. We'll see why that's important here in a minute. This is the black pupil in the center of your eye. Here's your iris. That gives you your eye color right there. And then you got your lens sitting right back here. Now, the reason it's a good idea to know that outline there is the long wavelengths, like we've already talked about, the radio waves, the TV waves, those kind of things, tend to pass right through your eye, just like the rest of your body. You get up here in the infrared range and they tend to be absorbed by your cornea. And so you get corneal burns. You're literally, it's like frying an egg in a frying pan. You know how when you crack the egg in, it's clear and then it goes white because you put the heat into it? Basically that same analogous kind of an idea happens to your cornea. You get up into this range, which is your IRA, your visible, so here's the visible light we're going to talk about next, tend to be absorbed a little bit by your lens and by the, not really by the cornea, but that gets back into the retina in the back of your eye. Now you notice some of those infrared A's, the very short wavelengths, can get back in and cause retinal burns on the back of your eyeballs from a light wave that you can't see or can't feel. You get up into the UV, and those tend to be stopped or absorbed by the lens of your eye. You get up a little higher and they're absorbed by your cornea again and then you get the really short waves and they've got enough energy they go right through it. So here again in your eyes you have the same kind of effect that we saw here. Certain frequencies will cause damage, others will go right through and not do anything. Okay, moving up into visible. So this is the range of light that our eyes can see. It ranges, the wavelength is about 700 nanometers to about 400 nanometers, give or take. Now these ranges are not precise. It's not like 400 is purple and 401 is UV. It's, kind of, it's a gradient, it's kind of a range. Um, but in the world of light, you have red, green, and blue are the primary colors. And when you mix red and green, you get yellow. When you mix red and blue, you get magenta. And when you mix blue and green, you get cyan. That's why they have those printer colors in your printer ink. Um, kind of different, most people think of primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. That has to do more with pigments and, and dyes. When you're talking with light, it's those three. So we're gonna do another demo here. So remember that 
Red has a longer wavelength, it's about 700 nanometers, has a little less energy. Blue and purple has a shorter wavelength and more energy, so let's see an example of that. So I need somebody to volunteer to come hold this for me. And then I need somebody to kill the lights for just a second. So we're going to blank this for just a second here to make it a little darker. You want to kill the light? You want to hold this for me? Okay. So if you want to just hold that there. And I'm going to be very careful that I don't point these lasers in your eyeballs because I'm the laser safety officer and that would be bad if I pointed lasers in your eyes. Keep it pointed that way. Yeah, so I'm going to come around here so everybody can see. So you kind of angle it just enough so that I can hit you but people out there can see. So here is my red laser. And you notice it doesn't really do much on that plate, but watch what happens when I do my blue. Cool. Same way with police lights, I can see those a lot easier. Blue. So again, you, you do the red, and it doesn't do much. Maybe you angle it so the folks over there on that side can see it, but now you put on this one, and you can see the effect. Does everybody here see that? Let's turn it over this way so these guys can see. So here's your red, and you see that doesn't change anything on there. And here's your blue, purple. Okay, thanks. Let's get the want to buy a vowel or anything. <laughs> Let's get the light back on. So the idea here is those lasers have about the same amount of milliwatts per square centimeter, the same power, but because the one has the shorter wavelength, the more energy. Let's turn this back on it tends to be absorbed by this glow-in-the-dark screen. It absorbs that energy and causes it to glow in the dark. So, moving on. So here's your spectrum of visible light. So you've got red down here is the long, right up here is the division between visible light and UV. Right at this high end you get blue light. Let's talk about that one for just a minute. Most of the blue light that we're exposed to comes from the sun, assuming you don't live in a cave. That blue light, kind of in this range right in here, has been definitively shown to affect your alertness, your memory, your circadian rhythms, which is what wakes you up in the morning and helps you go to sleep at night and have that you know, cyclical awake sleep time at a time. This has been proposed as one of the causes why people get depressed in the wintertime because they're not getting as much sunlight, they don't get as much blue light, and it makes them depressed because blue light, for whatever reason, seems to help people feel better about themselves. Here's the kicker though. Fluorescent lights, uh, let's see a quick example of that. We'll plug this one in just so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. In our digital age, we've got computer screens, we've got phone screens. A lot of them tend to be pretty high in blue light because it draws your attention in and it helps you know, keep you alert and all that kind of thing. But you notice, different. you can have like a warm white and a cool white and a daylight white. You've all seen that in fluorescent light bulbs. Same kind of thing happens in digital screens. Well, the problem is, at that high energy visible light, it's still in the range you can see, tends to cause eye strain. And so you look, if you've got a job where you're sitting there at your computer, staring at a computer screen all day, it tends to bug out your eyes after a while and you get, you know, tension headaches and your eyes get dry and irritated and all that kind of thing. So what do you do? You can, you know, minimize your screen time. Take a break every hour. Get yourself some computer glasses that filter out those blue light waves. Um, you can buy computer glasses. There's filters, screen size filters you can put in front of the screen that will filter out those kind of lights. Those have been not proven to be, but have been linked to AMD, age-related macular degeneration which is the like, leading cause of blindness in older folks is AMD and that's been linked to exposure to high levels of that high end of the visible spectrum. So here's one thing you can do. If you got an iPhone, oh yeah. Um, do they have light, I've heard that they have light bulbs or different types of lamps that actually produce the simulated sunlight so that it's mm -hmm. actually better for you in wintertime. 
Yeah. That's not true, yeah. Yeah, and there are people that swear by them. There are folks that will go to like the equivalent of like a tanning salon. They get exposed to those high blue light because it supposedly makes them feel better. You can buy the daylight whites and yeah, it seems to affect people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, but if you go to your, but the idea is like we were talking about before, it's moderation. Our bodies are designed so that, you know, five minutes of being out in bright sunlight isn't going to cause permanent blindness. We're not going to die. But at the same time, you know, if you're going to be out there eight hours a day in the peak hours a day when the sun's right overhead, get yourself a pair of sunglasses. You know, it's kind of a common sense kind of thing. Okay, so if you go to your iPhone, you go into your settings, come down here to display and brightness, you can go over there, come down here to this night shift, and then right down here there is a less warm, more warm slider, and you can filter out some of those blue, harsh, intense blue waves. If you got an Android phone, you go into your settings, and you come down here to display, and then about halfway down you got this dark mode, and then they've got this blue light filter. You can turn those on and it will help filter out some of those intense blue rays when you're looking at your phone. The other thing they recommend is doing this at night because again that blue light tends to keep people awake and so that's why they recommend shut off your computer, shut off your phone a couple hours before you go to bed because that seems to help people relax better not having that intense energy hitting their eyeballs. Okay. Moving on, UV, we're going to go through this one kind of quick. There's three kind of subcategories there. UVA is what we have the most of. So this is about 95% of the UV that hits the surface of the earth. If you've ever seen the black lights, you know, that kind of purple looking, you know, makes things fluoresce. Those are all in the UVA range, but it's absorbed by the lens of your eye and they contribute to skin aging and wrinkling. You get up a little bit shorter wavelength. It can't penetrate as well into your skin and fortunately a lot of it is absorbed by the ozone layer but it gets absorbed by the cornea of your eye, the outer layer. So what ends up happening is you get a condition known as snow blindness or welder's flash. If you're, anybody here from a, heard welder's flash? Yeah, or photokeratitis is the actual name in it, is what it's called. The idea is those UV rays, just like when you go out and you're either up skiing or you're out water skiing, hanging out on the boat going fishing, and you get a, who's had a real bad sunburn? Skin turns bright red. Imagine that same thing happening to the cornea of your eyeball. You essentially sunburn your eyeballs. And it is extraordinarily painful. Um, they, I've never had a real bad case. I have had a minor case, but they, it's described as sandpaper every time you blink your eyes. And it's just nasty. And that's all from overexposure to UVB. Um, you get up into UVZ, fortunately most of that's absorbed by the atmosphere, but if you go over into like the life sciences building or chemistry building, a number of other places on campus, they have UV lamps. Those put out a UVC which kills microorganisms. So if you look on filtered water, a lot of them, and if you read the label, it will say filtered and purified by ozonation or UV what they're doing is they're hitting that water with a UV light. You can even get water bottles that have a battery operated UV light in it. So when you're a backpacker, you go collect your water out of the stream, you turn on the UV light, and it zaps all the bugs and bacteria in the water and makes it safe to drink. They're very high energy and so it kills those kind of things. So what you want to do to minimize your exposure because depending on what time of day and what season it is, whether the earth is tilted toward the sun or away from the sun, which hemisphere you're on and what latitude you're at, whether you're farther north or down by the equator, whether you're down here in the valley or up on the mountaintop, all these kind of things affect your UV exposure. But what you really want to do is to protect your eyes, get a good pair of sunglasses that block all of the UV. So if you get polycarbonate lenses, which is what these are, polycarbonate does a pretty good job of blocking out UV. They can put in other things into the lens that will help it block even more, but as opposed to say a glass lens, 
polycarbonate absorbs them a lot better. Uh, we'll do a quick demo here, but again, as you're getting your sunglasses, remember that you've also got light can come in this way. And so you want to make sure you've got a pair of sunglasses that are either the wraparound or a goggle or you've got some kind of side shield on them to protect your eyes from some of those rays. So let's get the other light on here. We'll do another quick demo here. So who's familiar with polarized lenses? A few of you? Okay. For any fishermen in here? Fishermen tend to love polarized lenses because it turns out all those waves coming from the sun, all that visible light, as it hits the water, tends to become polarized. Well, if you look at your, down and you're trying to see the fish down there in the water, if you look at it through a polarized lens, your sunglasses, if they're polarized, will block the glare coming from the sun, but it won't affect the rays coming out of the water and allows you to see the fish without all the glare. Um, so I've got two polarized lens here, lenses here. What they're designed to do is so the light coming from the sun is in all different directions. It's this way and this way and waves are going this way and this way and this way and all kinds of directions. What the filter, what the polarized lens does is it blocks out all the light except for what's going in one direction. So what happens is, is the lights go in all different directions. Only the light waves that are going parallel with the lens will go through. So they're excellent for reducing the overall glare and light. But if you have two lenses together, if you turn one sideways, what makes it through the first one won't make it through the second one. So we'll do a quick demo here and just kind of, I mean, you see that? Magic. Yay. That's why we like science. So that's kind of the important thing. So when you get your sunglasses, get yourself a pair that's polarized. Um, what was that? Not that pair. They're broke. <laughs> Actually, those are my prescription ones. And you notice. So, oh, yeah. Lens did pop out. <laughs> we'll do a repair on. Oh, I can see the screws come undone. Anyway, but they are mirror coated and that helps reflect waves. You got side shields, yeah, so take care of that kind of thing. Protect your eyeballs. All right, let's get the front light out again. And let's see, moving on. So now we're in the last section, then we're going to wrap it up here in the next few minutes. So these are the really high energy. Now remember, these are the ones that are ionizing. So these are the ones you really got to watch out for. These are the ones that tend to cause cellular damage. Um, I imagine everybody in here has probably at some point in their life had a dental x-ray, uh, checked for cavities or you've broken a bone and the doctor goes in and what you need to think of here is, is the medical benefit of being exposed to that energy worth the risk of being exposed to it? If you know that you are, if you have every indication to believe that you're perfectly healthy, do you want to go in for a PET scan? Positive emission tomography, high radiation field? No, probably not. Because absorbing all that energy isn't going to do you any good. And if you're healthy anyway, why do it? Now, if you're dying of cancer and you've got a confirmed tumor, is it worth absorbing a little more energy to have that diagnostic tool available to you? Yeah, it is. Uh, you go to the dentist. Would you rather have your teeth rot and fall out or be exposed to a very minimal, relatively safe amount of radiation for a split second while they hit the button and take an x-ray of your teeth? It's probably worth it. Um, so here's another demo we're going to do. Remember that these are very highly penetrating. Now, just to give you an idea, what we're going to look at here is a sample of cesium-137. It's a radioactive material. If you had one gram of cesium, 137, now to give you an idea of a gram, in case you don't know, a United States penny, think of a little copper penny, is about three grams. So if you cut a penny in third, and think of how much that would weigh. One gram of cesium-137 is kicking off 3.2 trillion gamma photons every second, non-stop. That's a lot of these photons flying out of there. They're 
pretty highly radioactive and the energy of them is about 662 keV, which is a pretty moderate, you know, reasonable amount of energy. So of course I brought one. And we're going to look at that. So let's get the light on for a second so everybody can see. Get me a drink here. Okay. So, got my little box here. My lead shielding here. And we'll grab out, this is my cesium 137 source. Now, I've got a meter here. Let's turn it on. Okay. Now, there's background radiation all around us. There's cosmic rays coming from the sun. There's uranium and thorium in the soil. Um, a lot of times concrete, cinder block, all have your radioactive elements in them. It's naturally occurring. It's all around us. You can't get away from it. So I'm going to turn on the little indicator here so you can hear it. So what's, what's happening here is every one of those clicks you hear is the probe is detecting one of those radioactive gamma rays or an x-ray. We probably don't have any x-rays in here though. But it's picking up the gamma rays from that source there. So now, just listen to it and watch what happens as we get closer. And the idea is, as, it, as that source gives off that energy, they diverge. So the farther you stay away from it, the more likely it is it's going to go over your head or under your feet rather than right into you. So you keep your distance from them. So what let's do, I have a, about a 30 pound, 40 pound chunk of lead here, about two inches thick. And again, what we want to do is protect ourselves from that energy. So now listen to the difference here. So here's our background. Turn that over so you can hear it. Do you hear any difference? Yeah. In fact, you can even go, let's try this. So they're going under the table, through the table, through the plastic, but they can't make it through the lead. So the message there is avoid exposure to those high energy photons if you can. If you have to be around them, Make sure you have some shielding. Same principle applies with everything we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes. If you're up on the roof of the ASB and you see the sign that says stay out of this area because you may exceed exposure, generally accepted amounts to this radio frequencies, don't go beyond the barrier. If you go over in the Benson building, and you see a sign like this that says danger radioactive material. This one's in the Clyde building, that one's over in the Ellsworth building, that one's in the uh, Iring Science Center, that one's in the Museum of Peoples and Cultures. We got these things all over campus. If you see the signs, stay away from them. Just like you know here, the farther you keep away from them, the better off you are. It's getting kind of warm in here. It is, but fortunately we're about done. I mean, it's going to get a lot warmer because you're sitting right on front row. Now, here, here's the thing to make you a little comfortable though. I'm the radiation safety officer for the BYU. Do you really think I would bring a source in this room that's going to be hazardous? No. That would be an exceedingly bad idea. That is considered a safe amount, and that's the only reason I would have brought it in here. Um, but but you, uh, hopefully you get the point. I mean, not only is the room, because it really is getting hot in here, if you ask me. We've got a lot of pokes in here. Now, here's your, here's your quiz question. What kind of energy are we all putting off in here, because this room's getting warm, because we're all sitting in here? Thermal. Thermal. 
<clears throat> so what's happened is, is our bodies are all either converting the candy you've been eating into sugars and our bodies are metabolizing those and creating energy and that's being radiated off or we're absorbing infrared radiation from the sun or all these other sources and we're giving off all that thermal heat. Yeah, so watch out for that because okay? that gives you heat illnesses and heat stress. So last slide here and then we're done. Top five things you should know. If you learn nothing else today, let's get that front light again. Thanks for your help with that. Here we go, number five. Warning signs are usually posted for a good reason. Um, if you see them, abide by them. Some people put them up by mistake, but generally if it says warning, this may kill you, that's a good idea to watch out for those. Number four. Too much time looking at your cell phone or computer screens probably won't make you go blind or give you brain cancer, but it will almost certainly rot your brain, um, especially if you play like solitaire or you know free cell or you know, a computer game. Yeah, find something better to do with your time. Um, okay, number three. If you like tanning beds or all natural sunbathing, no commentary there on the honor code. Um, you had better also like malignant melanoma because those UVB and UVC waves love to cause skin cancer. That's why they tell you wear sunglasses, wear sunblock, wear long sleeve shirts, stay out of the sun between 10 and 2, all that kind of stuff because you don't want to absorb that kind of energy. Number two, blue has more energy and a higher frequency than red. Keep that in mind. And number one, Remember that of that whole light spectrum. And remember again, they're all light. Radio light, microwave light, visible light, infrared light, they're all light. Some of it might not affect you at all. Some of it might go right through you. Some of it might even help you, but some of it might kill you very painfully. So again, it's kind of a moderation. It's an awareness. Understand the, what all these kind of energies are out there. Do what you can. And I'm not saying panic and freak out and don't, you know, go do your jobs. But be careful. Be reasonable. Be prudent. If you can wear some personal protective equipment that will protect your eyes or exposure to your skin or your internal organs, do it. So, there we are. That's your... Final slide, that's your thought for the day. That's so you can say you were spiritually uplifted when you came to meeting today. And with that, we are done.